Hey guys, it's Dan here back with another video. In this one, I want to talk about my brand new NAS that I picked up. This is the QNAP H1288X. Uh, this is a beast of a machine and it's probably the most overkill NAS that any prosumer, small business is going to be looking to pick up. So in this video, we'll talk about what it does, what it does great, why you're going to be buying this something like this and now, if you should spend your money on this machine. So without further ado, let's get into it. Up until now, I have been using a small QNAP TVS 882ST3, which is an eight bay, two and a half inch SSD NAS designed specifically for SSDs. But because SSDs are expensive and my video library has been increasing the number of videos I've been making for YouTube, you can imagine, right? So uh, I have ran out of space and that's where this comes in. This right here, this is gonna be a little bit more traditional with three and a half inch bays and four uh, SSDs or four two and a half inch bays for a total of 12 drive bays. That's where the 12 in the model number comes from, the 1288X. Now also, uh, the H before the 12, the H1288X, the H signifies that this is a QUTS Hero operating system enabled system or NAS. Uh, actually, it's able to use both QUTS or QTS the difference is QUTS requires a little bit more hardware, a little bit more processing power. Uh, it is the ZFS version of QTS, and it's got the ZFS uh, capabilities of deduplication, uh, inline compression, and all you know ZFS benefits uh, if you decide to go that route. Now, being a QUTS system, having eight bays, actually 12 bays, uh, and having a Xeon processor puts it really in the high-end small business or you know, small enterprise range of NAS. And that's kind of where QNAP sits this NAS is kind of the enterprise level because of that operating system. Physically, this NAS is gonna be very similar to another NAS that QNAP put out a few years back, the 1282T or T3 Thunderbolt edition. Um, this, you know, it also has the eight bays and then the four SSD bays with the processor component here and the drive components here and then the three fans in the back. Uh, you know, physically it's the same, but it's the internals that's different. This has been updated to the latest 11th gen CPUs um, and it's got a little bit better I.O. USB 3.2. And speaking of the processor, the processor is gonna be one of the strongest, most powerful processors you're gonna be able to find in a NAS. Honestly, it's probably more powerful than some of your gaming computers because this is a six core, uh, 11th gen uh, processor, so Rocket Lake, and it's got uh, a boost up to 4.7 gigahertz. So it is a beast of a processor, especially for a NAS, because honestly, competition wise, uh, there's a lot of Ryzen 4 core processors. There's a lot of Atom core processors. There's a lot of um, you know, ARM-based processors or Xeon D, which you, know, you could have a lot of cores, but you're not gonna be able to have the boost in there. Six core Xeons up to 4.7 gigahertz boost and supports up to 128 gigabytes of ECC memory, especially for the ZFS operating system. This is really, really powerful of a NAS. Now, why would you, you know, want something so powerful like this? Well, for me personally, I wanted a powerful CPU to be able to power Plex. Uh, you know, may, some may think this is a little bit overkill for Plex, but honestly, in my experience, especially with the content that I have on my Plex servers, uh, a lot of anime which requires subtitles, and sometimes the subtitles don't necessarily uh, work automatically so you have the transcode and especially if you're transcoding high bitrate 1080p videos that really eats into that processor so one i wanted the processor power and two the cavi lake or sorry rocket lake rocket lake 11th gen processor uh has the latest intel quick sync transcode engine so it's got h264 and h265 encode and decode on the igpu 
Previous gen CPUs had the H.264 encode decode, but not the H.265. This has it all. And the Ryzen CPUs, the Atom CPUs, they don't have the iGPU, so they don't have the quick sync, they don't have the hardware transcoding capabilities that this system has. Additionally, if you need more graphics power, you can actually install a small uh, graphics card into this system, one of those really slim graphics cards. It will go into one of the slots. There are multiple PCIe slots in the back. Currently, this system is configured with a single 10 gigabit uh, Ethernet card, which is the Intel X55 T2 card, which is two 10 gigabit ports. This also has the capability to take the Thunderbolt 3 card. I chose not to go that way because my last NAS had a Thunderbolt 3 interface. And uh, in my experience, I've ended up constantly defaulting to 10 gigabit because it's just easier to use and it's always connected. I don't have to necessarily necessarily connect the laptop, whatever. Just overall, I prefer the 10 gigabit ethernet. And speaking of 10 gigabit ethernet, the system has the capability to sat fully saturate a 10 gigabit line. Copying and reading to and from the NAS, you're basically maxing out the 10 gigabit line. Um, we're gonna be seeing anywhere from a gig to 1.1 gigabytes per second, so 10 gigabits per second. Of course, that depends on the drives that you have in the drive base. This system I have currently populated with eight uh, Seagate, Iron Wolf NAS drives. So these are not the Iron Wolf, Wolf Pros, but just the regular Iron Wolf. So they've got, these are 7200 RPM drives, but they're not the extreme pros. I just didn't think that I needed those. Um, and with eight drives, I'm able to get pretty close to saturating that one 10 or 10 gigabit connection. Up here, the as for the SSD drives, I do have a couple or four Micron 1100 drives. These are two terabyte each. These are carryovers from my previous NAS. So um, they're a few years old. Think of them as something like an MX300 drive. So 500 megabytes per second read, 300 or so megabytes per second write. The performance on the SSDs, I'm able to uh, read, you know, fully read that saturate that connection, 10 gigabit, gigabit connection. Off of the spinning drives, I'm pretty close right at that one gigabyte or 950 to one gigabyte per second read and write. So overall, I think the way that this system is configured is perfect because the number of drives it's got, the 12 or the eight plus four, is really perfect for that 10 gigabyte threshold. If this had like a 25 gig or a 40 gig connection or card, which you can install, um, I think that's a little overkill because you're unable to fully saturate that, you know, that kind of connection. There is a slightly bigger version. I know I said that this is insane overkill and it's one of the best NASs that they do have or have. There is one bigger version. It's the 1688X. I won't go into detail about that. It's really similar to this one, only it's got 16 bays, so 12, 12, three and a half, and four SSDs, or something like that. So you're gonna get a little bit more throughput from your three and a half inch drives because you just got more of those drives. The last thing I wanna to touch upon about storage for this system is that you had two additional M.2 slots on the motherboard that you can populate. So these are Gen 4, at by four, so PCIe 4.0, 4X slots. So if you were to put like a 980 Pro in there, you, you would get that full bandwidth from both slots. I have not gone that route, partly because uh, I don't have the need for SSD caching. A lot of people like to put SSD caching thinking that they're gonna get better performance. Uh, this is running, again, ZFS, so QUTS Hero, and SSD caching isn't enabled. It isn't really going to benefit you in most workloads unless you have a lot of random re reads um, and specifically reads. Writing SSD cache doesn't even help writing for uh, ZFS because it's just the way uh, it is where it, the data hits the RAM first, the ARC, uh, the level two ARC or L2 ARC, which is your cache. 
Uh, without going into too much detail, it, it's, it's just not that much useful if you have a very, very big RAM pool, which is the ARC. So that's why uh, the recommendation is if you are using ZFS, get as much RAM into your system as possible and then start looking at cache if you do need that. The current configuration of memory I've got in here is a little bit of a mismatch. I've got the original 16 gigs in you know, two slots uh, populated and then I also picked up another 64 gigs, another in two slots. So I've got a total of 80 gigs of memory in here instead of the 120. Um, 80 gigs, one gigabyte per terabyte. Uh, I, I think that's probably a good place. I don't necessarily need the 128 gigabyte fully loaded memory on the system. I, I know I said more memory is better, but uh, if you're not utilizing the memory, it's still a waste. So I think that's kind of where, you know, I'm, I'm at, a, at a good point here. So eight drives, eight drives at 12 terabytes each. I've totally got a total of 96 terabytes on the spinning drives and then another eight in the SSDs for a total of 104 terabytes. I am running RAID Z2, which is RAID 6. So two of these are parity drives. So one, two, three, four, five, six, only six are actually capacity drives. And then plus over provisioning, um, you know, snapshots and whatnot. I'm, I think I'm actually down to only about 40 or so, 45, maybe under a little bit under 50 gigabytes of actual or terabytes of actual storage. So plenty for now, if I do actually want to install more drives or larger drives, I can always swap them out and install the larger drives. Now, a word of caution, if you are looking at buying a QDAP NAS with the QUTS operating system, you do have to be aware that ZFS does not allow you to increase the pool size uh, of number of drives after you've established the pool. So let's say you have six drives in here, you know, you say you don't need more than six, you'll leave the two empty for now. Uh, you'll populate the six, you create your pool, but then, you know, you wanna add in two drives later, you can't do that. You have to recreate the pool, which means you're wiping the data and then restarting over. So uh, that's one of the downsides of ZFS, but you know, upsides is of course, you're gonna get better performance read and write and again, all the ZFS benefits of the deduplication and, and compression and, and whatnot. So my recommendation is populate all your drives so that you, you choose a capacity where you can populate all your slots and run with that. So let's say instead of maybe buying 10 terabyte drives, buy six terabyte drives and populating all your slots. And if you were to upgrade in the future, maybe the three or four years down the line, and go to let's say 18 terabyte drives, you can swap them one at a time and you can do a one for one swap and then once all the drives are swapped, then you can increase that capacity, everything's fine. So that's kind of where, what I did is I went with the 12 drives um, you know, right off the bat for that additional capacity and also to populate all the drives so that in the future, if I were to upgrade the drives again, I can you know, swap them out one at a time without redoing my entire pool. On the back here, you have three fans, uh, four ethernet, one gig ports, and then the two 10 gig ports. You've got a handful of USB and an HDMI out and the power supply of the system, which is built internally. Speaking of fans here, let's talk about the noise level of the system. Within the operating system, you're able to control the fans based off of either manual or automatic. If you were to select manual and crank the fans all the way down to let's say 1%, uh, this system is virtually silent. So all the system fans run around six or 700 RPMs, which is silent, especially given the size of these fans. So that's not a concern. The CPU side also runs the blower style fans, the two blower style fans, one for the CPU, one for the, uh, for the motherboard, if, if, if you will. Those also run really quietly if you were to ramp them down. The power supply fan is really not a concern either. The only noisy fan in the system is the 10 gigabit card um, on the system. And this is kind of a, th this is probably, this is a recurring issue with QNAP NASs where their X550 T2 cards have this really, really, really 
noisy, I want to say like a 30, 20 millimeter fan on it. And uh, it, it's really loud. So I, what I actually did was I just disconnected the fan. Uh, I did that because, you know, I, in my previous NAS, I didn't have any issues with that either. And it's probably not recommended. But on the other hand, if you look at other Intel X550 T2 cards, the 10 gigabyte cards, they're passive. They don't have fans on them. And this also has a pretty good chunky heat sink on it. So honestly, I think it's probably pretty overkill given that I'm not gonna have multiple people, multiple editors hitting the NAS at the same time. It's just really me and maybe maybe you know, a couple family members, but I'm not gonna be loading up the card that much. Uh, I don't feel too bad about disabling that fan. So with all the, with that fan disabled, this system can be completely silent. Now, the only real noise that you get are from the three and a half inch spinning drives. I find these three and a half inch drives, although on the quiet side, you know, the, uh, the 12 terabyte Seagate drives are relatively quiet. Um, they're still 7200 RPM drive. And when they seek, they do create some noise. So the recommendation, my recommendation is to get a foam pad to, to lift the NAS up so that it's not on a table, so that the table doesn't kind of reverberate for seeking noises. And ideally, if you have a closet, you can throw that in the closet and you know, noise is not an issue at all because the fans aren't that loud. And if you, even if you put them in auto, uh, the fans aren't that bad. And the, as the drives themselves, you just have those you know, quiet clicking seeking noises of normal hard drives since you've got eight of those in the system. Uh, close the doors to the closet and it's not an issue. The last bit I want to touch upon is the performance of Plex. And remember I said I picked up the system because I wanted to have very good Plex performance. So I've got a couple of test files. These, This is the Jellyfish uh, HEVC or H265 400 megabit file, 300 megabit, 250 megabit or something like that. So I got multiple tests here. And what I'll do is queue up the highest bit rate, the 400 megabit file and play it. And what you'll see is that the transcode on, if I were to play it at original quality, uh, you're gonna still have to do a little bit of transcoding because uh, Plex doesn't do H.265 output. It has to transport, transcode H.265 to something like H.264 to be able to play it. But uh, if I do that, all six cores are maxed out to 100% in that transcode. And it's able to it's crunch all that out and it's able to play that video very smoothly. There is a slight hesitation at the beginning as it you know, preloads all that work, but about a one second delay, it starts playing and there is no stuttering. I have not seen any other NASAs to be able to truly do this kind of performance. Now, if you are to transcode it down to something a little bit smaller, uh, instead of 4K, let's say 1080p high, which is the preset for uh, about 20 megabits per second. 20 megabits per second is honestly higher than most uh, video uh, videos that you're gonna be seeing at 1080p. So this example here is gonna be, let's say the best anime file that you're gonna be uh, you know, running here, especially with those subtitles that you're transcoding in there. So you can see if I do a 1080p at 20 megabits per second, the system doesn't even really use the CPU. In this scenario here, what's happening is the hardware transcoding is taking effect. So the uh, H.264, H.265 transcoding, whatever, is all done hardware-wise. So that's why you're not seeing much of a CPU impact. And you know, 1080p, 20 megabits per second is really, really good of a file. So you can really load up the system with multiple streams of that if you wished and still be able to play. I'll make sure to link the source files for the Jellyfish demo videos in the link below so you can play around if you have NAS or if you have a Plex of your own, you can try transcoding and see how your system compares with this right here. And what I'll bet you is more likely than not, unless you have a dedicated graphics card, your system is probably not gonna actually be able to play that 400 megabit per second uh, 4K HEVC video on Plex. So hopefully this gives you a pretty good idea of what the TVS H2 or 1288X is all about and why you may want to pick up something like this. 
Um, I didn't really go into QTS Hero or the all the benefits of QTS Hero. Uh, you can go up to um, you know QNAP's website and research the difference between QTS and QTS Hero if this is for you. But Hardware-wise, this is a beast. This is a, a monster of a NAS. And especially if you have multiple editors and you're editing directly off the NAS or uh, you have virtualization where you're doing a lot of VMs, this thing will kind of chew through all of that. And it's really, really nice to use and work through as well. So uh, if you've got any questions, make sure to comment down below. I'll try to answer your questions. and. Uh, I'll also throw the links for this specific model in the description down below for your convenience as well. If you want to use those links, I'll help to support the channel. Uh, I appreciate it. Anyway, my name is Stan and I'll see you guys in the next one.